Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be solving, uh, talking about solving this problem. So this is this is the problem that makes makes it impossible for us to connect to external data sources and receive data about important events. So basically, neither Polkadot, Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever other network, they cannot on their own speak to data sources due to the nature of decentralized consensus. There's nobody that's designated as the source of external information in the way that blocks are generated. And even if you were to designate somebody, you'd have a ton of trust issues. So basically this uh, puts us in a situation where we can't get market data, contractual events data of various kind, like IoT for insurance or whatever other example you'd like, uh, shipping data for shipping related things, you know, any, any contract that you can think of that would want to know something about the external world outside of the chain or would want to make a payment or touch a system outside of the chain to do something meaningful, uh, it, it can't do that right now. Right? So that's why a lot of the very cool use cases we're all excited about, and in our opinion, that's why a lot of them aren't on production, and that's why uh, they aren't getting adopted, and that's why we all keep giving each other tokens all day long. Tokens are fantastic, great. I, I like tokens, very useful, absolutely. But if, if, if smart contracts like, are, gonna be, are gonna become the technology that becomes a, a standard for how agreements are done, then they need to know what's going on. If they don't know what's going on, they, they can't resolve in a meaningful way against you know, the real world, right? So this, this is a problem that people that are closer to production run into, but everybody that's gonna be, that's building towards actually getting to production or anywhere in the process of getting close to you know, thinking about how is this gonna work on production, uh, yeah, I, I promise you they're gonna hit this problem, right? So if, if we can solve this problem, then we can have all kinds of insurance contracts, interesting contracts related to, you know, whatever, whatever you can think of about an external event. Shipping, weather, you know, whatever, whatever category of contracts you're interested in, right? Now, the, the solution for this um, initially seems relatively simple. You basically designate a trusted third party. The trusted third party is called an oracle. The trusted third party is re responsible for delivering the data to a specific contract, you know, in a specific format, on a specific schedule, right? So that's, that's just the idea of middleware. So it's basically, since blockchain networks cannot get data on their own, since they cannot reach out and talk to any API whatsoever, they, they need a trusted third party to do it on their behalf. They basically need an off-chain agent. This off-chain agent is blockchain middleware, and that off-chain agent can basically you know, ingest data, process it, and give it to contracts on, on whatever chain. And uh, they can also, yep, yeah, sorry, wrong way, wrong way. Um, and they can also take commands from the contracts and as an off-chain agent, execute meaningful off-chain events, such as traditional payments. So if you were making some kind of application that needed you know, some data for it to, to know what's going on in the real world, and then you wanted it to pay people in their bank account or in PayPal or whatever you wanted. In both of those, from, for both, from both the input and the output side, you need an off-chain agent, basically. Trusted third-party off-chain agent. Now, what, what this does is it creates certain problems in, in the trust model of, of blockchains, right? Blockchains and smart contracts are particularly attractive because they have uh, extreme levels of reliability and determinism and kind of co the contract co contractual code executed as written, right, is, is, is the general idea. Now, if you start triggering this highly deterministic system that's very difficult to roll back and that has a certain unique type of permanence to it with an insecure system that's, that's very easy to break, right, like if you just tweak the inputs or you mess with the inputs, you, you can stop the system from working, right? So in our, in, in our opinion, the, the meaningful question is, not, it, it is a meaningful question, how do we get the middle piece working? How do we get contractual state properly secured and verified across enough individual node operators for that contractual state to be reliable and for those contractual state changes to be considered reliable by, by, by counterparties, right? Great, great project, absolutely, so excited. Five years in the making, we're doing it, I love it, personally. Um, but in order for the thing to actually be useful, it needs to be secure end to end. Right, if, if the thing in the middle is secure and then 
all the systems, like the system triggering it can just fall down very easily, then the end-to-end -end reliability is low. If then the end-to-end -end reliability is low, it's not gonna get used. Because people don't care about like the successful characteristics, security characteristics of this piece or that piece or that piece. They care about the end-to-end -end reliability, right? So the, the project we're engaged in is basically getting us to a point where we're assuming that really smart people are gonna solve that middle piece, right? Ethereum, Bitcoin, Polkadot, like a bunch of, bunch of really, really smart people. And then we're focused on making sure that the end-to-end -end, uh, relationship that the contract in the middle has to all its inputs and outputs are secure enough that people still consider it to be a, a reliable, a more reliable, a better way to do digital agreement, right? So there's, there's basically two, uh, two pieces to our approach. The, well, the, well the, actually before we want to jump into our approach, it might be useful to look at what, what not to do. So what, what you probably don't want to do is you don't want a data source and a decentralized computation system and then, you, and then there's like one node triggering thousands of nodes, right? This is, this is the scenario you want to avoid because in this scenario, we're basically saying we have this super reliable piece of contractual state running and changing here, but then it's triggered by a highly unreliable, unreliable system that you, know, you can take down with relatively minimal, minimal effort using a, you know, a ton of approaches we don't have time to go into. But yeah, that's not good. That's not gonna, so just to reiterate, that's, that's, that's the way probably not to do it. Uh, if we think about the ways to do it, there's two fundamental approaches. Um, one approach is basically decentralization, right? Why do we feel smart contracts are reliable? Because there's many independent node operators confirming that something is happening about the contract, basically. That there's a state change according to some certain set of rules, you know, so on and so on, right? So if we just follow this logic and we extend it out to our ability to guarantee the reliability and quality of inputs, the approach we would take, logically speaking, would be let's decentralize, let's have multiple people verify inputs, let's them have them come to consensus off-chain, Let, let's have whatever method of consensus between multiple independent node operators to make sure that an input is reliable. And once you decentralize the middleware layer, you can basically move on to decentralizing the data sources to tr triggering one data source, multiple data sources, you know, whatever collection you want. But the first step is, getting to a layer in between the highly decentralized contract state and the more centralized data sources, but a layer that can basically provide you reliable inputs. Now, I think what's useful is for us to, to walk through a quick example that just might put this in perspective. Um, so let's say we had a contract that did payment for delivery and we wanted to very accurately, redundantly verify and maybe create a fallback system to make sure that something was delivered, right? In our case, with Chainlink, right now you can go, go. you can get Chainlinks for, you know, for example, Ethereum, and you can get Chainlinks for these two data sources that I've just shown you. And you can have a redundant system that you know, checks itself against two data sources to make sure that something has happened. Then once the contract has uh, you know, concluded on the basis that, okay, I, the contract, no, no, that delivery has happened from two sources, you know, you could do one of two sources, you could do two of two sources, you can add five sources, you know, whatever level of reliability you, you feel you need. Then you need um, a more common situation where, is where you need market data, right? So now you, you know that the contract state has changed, it's time to pay somebody, but you need to know the market rate in order to know what to pay somebody, right? So let's say, for example, you wanna pay them in Bitcoin, you need to know the Bitcoin market rate. So now your, your smart contract gets the Bitcoin market rate from multiple sources, it, it has a reliable input now to tell it, okay, I know I need to pay, I know I need to pay this many dollars or this many that, and now I know that, okay, that's how much I need to pay, and then it can go to all kinds of systems to go and pay that, right? So this is a really simple example of somebody got something, and the contract was able to verify very reliably that they got it, and the contract was able to get another data point that it needed to accurately fulfill its commitments, right? So this is, this is essentially the decentralized thesis kind of in play. Um, here, here at the conference, yeah, and also the, the, the gist of it is that uh, there needs to be a lot of these chain links. So like as in the previous example, we had multiple redundant uh, folks providing the same data. The, the goal of our, our body of work is basically making sure that there are hundreds and hundreds of, probably some thousands of chain links that people can go to and if they wanna just talk to one and get the data they need very quickly, 
by just dropping a piece of code into, into their contract and therefore getting the access to the resource they need, they can do that. If they want to pay for decentralization, they can form contracts with multiple chain links to redundantly verify the accuracy of, of, of their inputs, right? So, yeah, that's, that's the other kind of piece of the decentralized thesis is, is, a, is an abundance of, of choices for developers in terms of the inputs and outputs they can connect with. So that, A, they have inputs and outputs to begin with, and B, if they want redundant inputs to make sure that something has happened, they can, they can get that very easily uh, with, without any work on their end. Um, right, so, so that's the decentralization part of the thesis. On the basis of this thesis and our, our conversations with the folks at Web3, uh, I'm pretty sure that this morning there was uh, an announcement post about us working together. The um, announcement post is along the lines of that we'll be providing this, um, this capability basically into the Polkadot network. And what that means is that we'll be, and, and it's, this is just an example of how like this can enable contracts on other chains to function well, but basically we're working together to make sure that all the contracts running in the Polkadot network, when whatever parachain they're running or whatever place they're running in that network have access to a, a multitude of inputs and outputs so they can do meaningful off-chain uh, off chain actions. So the, the first way we're looking at doing that is we're basically taking those hundreds of chain links and we're just making them available on the Polkadot network in either relevant parachains or wh wherever they need to be made available by publishing a contract that represents that chain link, right? So there's a contract on chain, the contract on chain says, I'm the contract for chain link X and chain link X con connects you to data source X, right? And then your contracts on Polkadot network talk to contract X, tell it I need this, this, and this from data source X, and uh, the data goes in, right? And, uh, and format it on whatever schedule, with whatever conditions, and with whatever decentralization guarantees you, you, you would want to pay for, right? And that's on the basis of these decentralization guarantees that I think the folks at Web3 have said, okay, this is a very logical approach to making sure that inputs are put in correctly. The second part of the approach that we're gonna work on in kind of the second stage of our work together is the, the creation of something called a parachain. So that's a specific chain where other chains go to get um, external events data. And this is more or less a scalability solution once we've seen some, some more adoption on, on the oracles that are broadcast directly to people. So this is, uh, you know, kind of, we're announcing it, great. We're doing it, it's exciting, we're excited to enable more, more contracts to do more useful things on, on networks like Polkadot, Ethereum, all kinds of networks. Now, yeah, so then I think now would be a good time to go into the second piece of our, uh, 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 of our thesis. So the second piece of our thesis is, is more or less a defense in depth approach, right? So decentralization is one layer of reliability, it's kind of, the layer of reliability this space is really excited about with like super redundant systems. But with a defense in depth approach, you can still layer other additional layers of security, right? So the addition, not, not the main, but the additional layer of security that we're putting on top of decentralization is the integration of something called trusted uh, execution environments. So trusted execution environments, wh what they do is they basically make it extremely difficult for people to, for malicious, you know, malicious adversaries or even people running a piece of software to effectively mess with what's going on in, in, in a network or a piece of software or an environment. Now, some of the claims of trusted execution environments are very broad and very large and they're very difficult to attain and the technology is relatively early. So it is at an early stage in its development, but it does have potential as an additional layer of security, especially if, you know, considering the amount of smart people working on it. Um, basically, as, as a quick overview, what, what this allows is it makes it possible to have a separate piece of hardware with its own memory and its own processing capabilities that doesn't touch the operating system code, doesn't touch the hypervisor. This basically eliminates the attack surface area that other applications or a malicious third party has access to in terms of getting any kind of access to your code. So that's, that's the fundamental idea. The fundamental idea is perhaps not a completely secure but a more secure specialized piece of hardware that runs basically trusted code 
in relation to whatever application you want. So it's, um, it, it definitely eliminates a lot of attack surface area if the hardware can maintain the guarantees, the security guarantees it seeks to maintain. How that works in a little bit more detail is basically you have your own processor, you have some memory, lack of access from traditionally privileged resources that cause a lot of problems, and uh, you have the untrusted part of the application, that's just the outside world basically, uh, making either sending in completely encrypted uh, contract code or, or things to be done, or sending in you know whatever whatever they want the trust the more trusted environment to do. Now our approach to this is something called uh, Town Crier. Town Crier is an approach to, uh, developed at IC3 together with Cornell and and, and folks like that. Um, and what that, what that approach focuses on is the use of these trusted execution environments, initially Intel, Intel's SGX enclave environment for the acquisition of data and the return of that data back to, um, back to the contract. Uh, there's, yeah, so we're gonna just kind of walk through the benefits, benefits of this approach. One of, one of the main benefits is that you, you have a way to confirm that the data came from the right source and you have a way to sign the data in the enclave and publish that signature on chain for verification if needed. So uh, once again, assuming the trusted hardware environment is secure, you, you have a private environment where basically you can do all kinds of computations that you wouldn't even want the node operator to know about. I mean, how it works in the case of Town Crier's initial implementation is relatively simple. You have a on-chain contract that represents the resource, such as a data feed. There's a user contract that requests the data that is connected to the code running in the enclave responsible for fulfilling, for retrieving, signing, and you know, delivering the data. The data is retrieved, verified, signed, and returned. All of this can be done with the node operator uh, not, not even knowing what they're doing in, in many cases, other than maybe where, where they're sending a request or something like that. Um, one, of, one of the main things that, that we find attractive about this Prop, the properties of trusted execution environments is if we want to make a decentralized Oracle network, it does make sense to make it very difficult for anybody to take down any single node, right? With, with a trusted execution environment, what you basically have is you have confidential, you, you, you have the ability to run the code confidentially. Both, both from, the, from the perspective of the node operator, so you can have 100 independent node operators, and those 100 independent node operators don't, don't know what they're running. The only thing they can do is they can shut off their node and they can say, I'm not, I'm not online, at which point they immediately become, it becomes clear that they're very bad node operators and you don't, you know, you don't want to rely on them. Now, this is attractive because it, it basically makes, it, it makes, makes the security burden for being a node operator much less. It shifts it into the use of this specialized hardware and it expands the ability for hundreds, thousands of people to, to successfully secure a node that's responsible for doing these very important things like delivering data to a contract to trigger it, right? So one, one, of, the, one of the big attractions is that there's a secure environment that solves a lot of security issues for people that wanna be third parties providing data to contracts within a network of third parties that wanna do that, right? It kind of just like, you know, we give you code, you run code in SGX, you keep, you know, your DevOps thing going and you keep as many things as you can secure and uh, chances are to work out if, if some of, even some of the guarantees of trusted hardware are delivered. Uh, the second thing that's interesting is that it can do credential management. So if you, if you have credentials related to triggering payment, those credentials are usually pretty important because they trigger payment and payment is money and money is important. And so keeping credentials in a more secure environment, generally speaking, makes sense. So for the services that are actually responsible for, for example, signing a Bitcoin transaction on behalf of an Ethereum contract, or that are responsible for sending a bank payment, their ability to keep the credentials that actually sign uh, and, and authorize the, the payment, like the outcome of the contract, can now be kept in a, in a more secure environment. Uh, the other interesting thing that I think actually out of most rooms, the people in this room would appreciate is that uh, smart contracts can now control private keys. So basically a smart contract can send uh, a command 
to a trusted hardware environment that houses a private key, and that that private key can then sign whatever you want it to sign, a Bitcoin transaction, whatever else. Once again, assuming the trusted hardware remains functioning and delivers its security guarantees and retains confidentiality, then, 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 then this works. Um, and that's something being worked on, but, 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 but seems to show promise. So that's, that's actually a very, very cool and underappreciated case of contracts being able to control private keys for all kinds of other systems. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. So then the other piece of, I mean, the other piece of the benefits of trusted hardware is basically the fact that you can start doing off-chain computation. So now you have this secure computation environment that provides certain privacy guarantees and reliability guarantees. And so you can say, I want highly reliable computation to happen in this environment. This could be something like, you know, creating an index for multiple data sources, running some kind of model that you want to keep private, but you need to be part of your contract for the sake of your counterparties. Um, basically, it provides, it provides an environment where off-chain code execution that you wouldn't want to do on-chain for privacy reasons or for scalability reasons can happen, either in one or, or many nodes. Uh, yeah, so there's a scalability benefit to that. There's definitely a huge uh, benefit to being able to do off-chain computations in a, tr in a more traditional environment between four or five highly resourced nodes, and the computations will remain private, assuming that the trusted hardware guarantees are, are fulfilled. Uh, also, one of the cool things that you can do is you can use well-tested libraries, uh, and I'm going to walk through very quickly uh, an interesting example where we generate randomness using, using a trusted execution environment for, uh, for, for a lottery contract to, to show just how that, how that would look, right? So if you, if you have a lottery contract, and if you actually look on mainnet, a lot of stuff is, is basically this. It's like some form of gambling. The, 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 I mean, that's what it is right now. I can't, can't say anything about it, right? Um, so basically, the, the lottery contract needs randomness. It needs to know it, 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 needs, it needs some level of trustworthy randomness to guarantee that, the, that it isn't being gamed by its owner or by whoever's running it. This is the traditional problem with lotteries, or supposedly the, pro the trust problem solved by, by blockchains and smart contracts in the context of, of lotteries. So how this works from the perspective of uh, you know, a chain link node and one that uses a trusted execution environment is you ra run a random number generation library that has something like you know, 40 years of usage. So like a very well-tested, very reliable piece of software for random number generation that everybody would agree is, is the, you know, what you would use, like an OS level resource. Uh, you would have the contract say, give me randomness through the chain link running, r running this uh, library in a trusted environment. It would return the relevant randomness and that would be given by the chain link back to the contract, right? And okay, maybe you're, maybe you're comfortable with this. Maybe, maybe this gives you some comfort in, in, in the delivery of randomness to your lottery contract and to your users and that you are not gaming the randomness in favor of you know, some user that is you or, or some friend of yours. Now, another, another option of this, and this is what, where the decentralization thesis, I think, really, really holds up, is even if you have trusted hardware I, I, and, and you really want to guarantee randomness, it still makes sense to me to have multiple nodes uh, providing that 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 randomness, either with or without SGX, right? So, basically, this is this is the, 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 this is the two th the two theses together. It's basically, let's decentralize and make a input reliable. Let's make the software that's providing the input very secure, uh, so that we know the input is probably reliable, or it's very difficult to make unreliable, even on an individual level, right? So it's just additional layers of security. And, and we're working on even more layers that make, make this more difficult, right? So basically then what, what you need is you need an out, outgoing payments mechanism, in which case your lottery contract can pay out in Bitcoin or it can pay out in retail payments or bank payments or whatever, whatever, uh, whatever form of payments you, you, you'd like. This is the other part where having relevant outputs allows you to build contracts that you, know, you can make a lottery contract that isn't just giving people crypto, it's giving people real money. And that, at least for the next couple of years, while people want money in their PayPal or bank account or wherever, is, is, is a useful output you might want to put onto your contract if you find it valuable, right? We're, we're, we're just going to provide a ton of inputs and, 
and basically, you know, excitedly help people build good things. Uh, so yeah, so basically the, 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 the goal of our body of work is to create this end-to-end -end reliability to make sure that not just the thing in the middle is secure, to make sure that the average security of the entire setup is high enough that people will use it as a replacement for traditional digital agreements, right? Until, like, the, the, there's just, in my opinion, there's just really two properties. We need feature parity with digital agreements, and then we need to have something better than what they have, which is basically the determinism and reliability of smart contracts, right? Feature parity is I can talk to all the inputs and outputs I need to talk to, and then the overall reliability of the system is the additional benefit of the system that allows smart contracts to become like the dominant standard for digital agreement in pretty much, in my opinion, all, all, all industry backends, right? But until we achieve both feature parity in terms of the usefulness of smart contracts and you know, re while retaining their highly deterministic reliability, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to tell somebody, re replace your traditional digital agreement that, that does all this stuff in the external world. Uh, right, so our approach is decentralization and providing a large collection of both uh, inputs and outputs while layering on um, as many layers of security as we can, starting with trusted execution environments, going on to zero knowledge and, 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 and other approaches. And yeah, so that's, I mean, that's our approach. We, we plan to have hundreds of chain links available uh, to people soon uh, so that they can combine them with their contract code on various networks and basically make their contracts capable of like winning. People should be showing up to meetings at insurance companies and, and securities firms and all kinds of places, and they should just be winning. But right now, they're not always winning. They're not necessarily winning. Because when they show it to a CIO or a lead architect, he's like, how does that actually work? What's the end-to-end -end security? And it falls flat, in, my, in our opinion, or in our experience. But if they start showing up and they say the end-to-end -end security is very high, it's already connected to all the inputs and outputs you're used to, and it's gonna do everything you need to do in a highly reliable, highly secure manner, then, then that just, you just win, in my opinion. Because, the, yeah, it's, it's great, it's a good thing. Reliability, determinism, I like it. Uh, okay, great, we're, uh, yeah, that's it. Is there questions? Do I have time for questions? I can do something, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, you can verify the computation is made on chain. You can co compute, come to consensus off chain. If you want to pay more, you can have multiple oracles broadcast onto a chain to use the consensus of that chain via an on-chain contract, right? But whatever, whatever, whatever a trusted execution environment sends in, it would sign and you, and you will be able to verify the signature on chain. Yeah, I don't know if we have enough time to go into the details on that. Let's, com let's totally talk right after this, okay? Okay. Yeah, that's gonna take up like the whole thing, so. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how compensation works for the, for the oracles? Yeah, so the, the, the way it works is there's basically a market dynamic of how much decentralization do people wanna pay for, right? So right now we overpay for decentralization as a premium good because nobody can tell us this much decentralization buys you that much security, right? That's kind of, you can talk to the smartest people on the planet. I, I seek them out and hunt them down and I talk to them and they can't tell you. They can't tell you like this much decentralization versus this much buys you that much versus that much security, right? They can't do it. So what, what it's really gonna come down to is how much decentralization do people wanna buy Right? Do they want to buy three worth nodes, five, 10, 15, 20 nodes, 100 nodes, 1,000 nodes? And then what is the premium that those nodes can charge for the security guarantees they provide and the reputation they have for successfully providing those guarantees? Generally speaking, the prices p people pay right now for decentralization are very high. And yeah, the, it, it, like it, it depends on how much people want to pay for decentralization. If, if that's a good people actually want to pay for, we're making a system where they can say, okay, I wanna pay for 10 nodes of decentralization with these security guarantees, 
and this reputation for successfully performing. So that's like in an on-chain SLA contract or something to that effect? Yeah, exactly. So it's basically when the requesting contract does, uh, when the user contract does something with, with uh, the chain link, the Oracle contract, it, it presents it a service agreement that lays out what the Oracle is going to do for it, and then the Oracle makes a commitment. So the Oracle makes a commitment that I will fulfill these conditions, and then that collection of fulfillments forms the basis of the Oracle's reputation. Okay. okay. Yes, th this gentleman here. So you showed the slide uh, where there is a smart contract and in the smart contract clearly uses uh, private keys and I think this is a very interesting one. So uh -huh. could you tell us how you deal with the fact that typically you have a trade-off between uh, the latency on one side and the other side, the, the security, when you do a key sharing. So what's your approach here? So you mean key sharing between... Yeah, no, I, at the end of the day there is a private key, yeah? In a key sharing between the nodes or no, between who? Is, uh, or the, the accessibility of a private key. So you have a smart contract, mm -hmm. needs to execute something. So right. in, in a very simple case, a very secure case, mm -hmm. there is someone manually injecting a cold storage device, yeah? But uh -huh. it's, you clearly cannot scale that. So uh, if you uh, want to have high throughput, low latency in an in a industrial uh, system. So you need to have uh, somehow a manner, uh, a way how you can uh, share the, the private key or the, the secret of the private key, yeah? And so yeah, so you, mean key, key, yeah. you mean key management, basically. Yeah, exactly. So how do you uh, solve that issue in your uh, system? Yeah, so key management is definitely a difficult issue for, for, for usage of private keys by smart contracts. And it, it kind of depends what the private key is for and if you need to do key rotation, and how many parties need to have the key, or if it's a multi-signature setup. All of those capabilities we support, but it's, like key management is just a policy people have. So this is where you start to see the lines blurring between, we have an on-chain piece of the contract and we have an off-chain piece of the contract, right? The on-chain piece of the contract, in our experience, in our opinion, is probably kept smaller and it's kept there to basically facilitate information transfer and agreement about the key parts of the contract. And then a lot of the stuff that needs to happen that's either computationally intensive or you want to keep particularly private in today's systems limitations or you, know, you, 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 you can't do it on-chain for whatever reason, those types of things happen off-chain. So, so basically the, 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 the dynamic you're describing is part of an on-chain, off-chain dynamic where the contract is basically split into two parts. And then the security guarantees of, okay, we split the contract into two parts and there's a private key housed here that's responsible for performing these parts of the off-chain, right, the off-chain part of the contract. Those policies uh, are gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis and they're gonna match the requirements of each industry. Similarly how like the service agreements, they match the requirements of each industry. So basically, each, each industry has different user contracts, different latency requirements, different guarantees they need from their oracles. And so, yeah, basically it'll, it'll really depend on, on, on very specific use cases. The, does that add up for you? It does, okay, great. Um, yes? I just have a quick, quick question. Um, have you considered other trusted execution environments for uh, verifying the, the code beside of Intel? Um, yeah, yeah, we have. That's like another layer of decentralization. So then it's basically, let's use multiple trusted execution environments, either in one, in, in, in one kind of server blade or one place where they all run, or you know, multiple different nodes running one execution environment. And that, what that does is it spreads out the risk uh, uh, among one execution environment failing while the other ones continue to function. The problem with that is that there's not that many of them and not many of them are very far into development. Intel SGX seems to be the one that's, that's furthest ahead by far. And so if we, if we get into a scenario where we have multiple trusted execution frameworks, environments, pieces of hardware, right? And people wanna once again pay for that level of decentralization, at you know, at that level of of, of reliability, uh, yeah, we'll definitely enable them to do that. Yeah. So yeah. So the goal the goal for us is not to stick myopically with like one approach, one security approach, or one 
one one one one model one method for providing security in, in a very specific case like trusted execution environments it's to create a, a flexible system that has a defense in depth approach and can continually continue to include the best security kind of approaches to to making sure that the delivery and triggering of a contract is reliable right so the the whole goal for us is 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 like an extreme well not extreme but a large degree of flexibility you know, you, for however much decentralization you want to purchase and whatever specific security you want to purchase, zero knowledge proofs, Intel SGX, whatever, whatever it is in, um, in, your, in, in the triggering of your contract, basically, and your contract's fulfillment of its uh, promises. Yep. Does that, yeah, it does, okay. Oops. Yes, back there, I think I saw something. Um, so with the exception of this, um, doing the decryption on the chain link, everything else, um, you can you can basically delegate the system to any node on the system, no? You don't, uh, you don't need to give trust to them. Like any, any volunteer node should be able to run the chain link and give the service. Bless you. And then, and then me as the one who wants to run the smart contract, I can I can verify, for example, the computation or the result of inquiring from PayPal or Visa on like multiple nodes, and then I can like punish those that lied to me or. Uh, basically, uh, yes. Yeah. So the, the the model for decentralization is that you have multiple nodes verifying something, and then those that deviate, their reputation suffers. What you've said is that like any volunteer node, it's not necessarily that simple. The first part is nodes have to commit to fulfill the work that you're asking them to fulfill, which means they you know, have connection to the relevant resource or they run the relevant computation environment or they do whatever, whatever you need them to do, they, they already do and they've committed to do it for you. Uh, and then that really comes down to your decision of what you put in your service agreement to say, I want this quality of node operator, right? So maybe I wanna buy node operators that don't have the highest guarantees but I want to buy many of them, right? I want to buy a thousand of them because I, you know, that's uh, something I'm comfortable with. Maybe I want to buy less node operators with very, very high security guarantees. Maybe I want to do both for different parts of the work. Uh, basically, it's uh, it, this is an open question that that's that's just not going to get answered. It's uh, it's going to be a market. It's just market dynamics. No, no, yeah, no. It's independent. Absolutely. The whole, the whole point is not that we run nodes, it's that we make a piece of software, open source piece of software, that allow other people to become node operators that make money by reliably triggering and making externally connected contracts possible. That, that is the goal. If we're, if we're not running any nodes in like whatever amount of time, and there are hundreds, you know, thousands of people running, running successfully highly secure nodes, that's what, that's what we're going for. And our, our job is to maintain as much as we can the security of what those nodes deliver as they're being run by those people. Yep. Yeah, so right now we basically have the, the first initial version of this working. We've published a few chain links on our documentation page. The ones that I showed you in the example, those are all live. You can all use those. So if you wanted to build the contract that I showed you with the delivery and the payment and stuff, that, that, that could be built today. Uh, we're basically in the process of going through security audits for our, our, um, our smart contract code to make sure it's reliable through multiple security audit firms. And we are basically uh, also building out a large collection of chain links that are going to be connected to many, many other sources. You talked about triggering payments. Like, uh, is it possible with Chainlink to trigger a bank transfer based on the outcome of a smart contract? Yeah. If you, you, you what you need is you need you need a banking partner that's going to run the Chainlink software responsible for triggering your contract. So basically, banks are the entities that are permissioned and allowed to trigger bank transfers, and we make a piece of software that allows them to, trick, to, to ingest commands from your contracts. Yep. We have time for one last question. Okay, if there is one, I don't know, yes. 
there is, it looks like. So it, it seems like the value that Chainlink provides is split into, I guess, two buckets. One is the actual data feed and, and being able to trust the data feed, and then the other bucket's the triggers. Um, yeah, inputs and outputs, yeah. Yeah, so how, how do you think about free riders uh, when it comes to like the data feed component of that? What do you mean free riders? So if you have like, let's say you produce a, a good trusted data feed for like stock market prices, uh, and that mm -hmm. data feed's going into some contract that you can read from on chain. How do you stop other people that aren't uh, compensating nodes for producing that data mm -hmm. feed from consuming it in their own contract logic? So first of all, most contracts, it, it, it's, it's not written on them that I'm like consuming the market data feed. Second, uh, second of all, most of the time people wanna buy, they wanna know what they're buying, like a reliable piece of data. If you, for, for their specific use case, if you're saying that there's gonna be a contract out there that gets a piece of data, that, and it gets that data in exactly the way that other contracts wanna consume that data, and then those contracts learn, learn of that and go to that contract to consume its data, then basically, I mean, the dynamics start to center around privacy and whether you do the computation around data off-chain and you deliver a true-false statement, or if you can implement some masking approaches to make sure that other contracts can't acquire the data. So there, there are approaches to doing this, but right now in the, in, the, in the near term, it's not a particular problem because these contracts don't exist right now. And the, the reality, like the contracts that are consuming market data to trigger you know, billions of dollars in payments, right? And anybody who's making a highly reliable contract now, I mean, we're in conversations with hundreds of teams, literally hundreds of teams about like, here's what I need for my contract to work. And everybody wants, everybody just wants to purchase and consume a data feed uh, to make sure that they're, that, like they want a commitment. Like they don't want a situation where somebody sends in a service agreement for somebody else's contract and all of a sudden their contract doesn't get the data they need. And that's how they've written and published their contract because you know they wanted to save 50 cents a day or something, or not 50 cents, but like $50 or 500 or whatever. Um, so like, yeah, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how many web developers would build an application that way either, right? Like they would like steal somebody's API key and they would use it hoping that person doesn't run out of credits or, <laughs> you know, I guess you could do that, but I don't, I, that, that's not what we're seeing, right? We're seeing people say, I wanna purchase um, I want to purchase something on this schedule with these commitments and the Oracle makes those commitments and now they can show people here I have a reliable input, here's my contract code, here's my output, it's all set up reliably, right? Makes sense. Okay, looks like we're good then, thank you very much.